Um, as Carolyn mentioned, I've been asked to talk about current trends of democratization in Africa today. And uh, as you all probably know from watching the news, uh, 2011 has been a great year of change in uh, governance patterns in Africa. Uh, first slide, please. And with the fall of the Gaddafi regime in uh, Libya in, uh, as, as an ongoing process, but uh, over the past several weeks, linked with uh, the forced uh, uh, removal of uh, presidents in Egypt and Tunisia, we've seen just in this past year the casting out of over 100 years of autocratic governance just in North Africa. And this has deservedly um, garnered a lot of international media attention. But in the process, it has uh, also overlooked um, or, or caused many people to overlook the other changes that have been happening on the continent. Next slide, please. Um, in Cote d'Ivoire, we saw a uh, really important change in power when the incumbent leader there, Laurent Bagbo, had refused to cede authority after he had lost an election last November. This led to a, a long standoff uh, and, and some violence leading, in fact, to the deaths of some 3,000 people, uh, some intervention uh, from the United Nations, but ultimately the removal of uh, Mr. Bagbo from power and the uh, ascension to power of the uh, elected uh, candidate, uh, Rizan Mutara there. This was important as a step for democracy in itself, but it was particularly important in Africa because the model in Cote d'Ivoire was paralleling what we had seen in Zimbabwe and in Kenya in previous years where incumbent leaders uh, were uh, ignoring electoral results and in those cases had successfully done so, uh, negotiating power sharing deals and, and, and remaining in power today. So the situation in Cote d'Ivoire is precedent setting in that Africa was making the decision and indeed uh, virtually all African countries supported uh, the uh, removal of uh, Laurent Bagbo uh, that elections are going to matter uh, in Africa. There's a situation in Guinea where uh, it is one of the countries that since independence was never democratic and for that most part it has had military governments <coughs> but um, uh, it through a series of uh, events held its first presidential elections last November um, and uh, elected in a very close race uh, Alpha Conde as its new first democratic president uh, and, and remarkable too in that um, the loser of that election uh, accepted the results very graciously and, and stepped aside in setting a very good precedent uh, for that country. There's the case of uh, South Sudan, if you can do the next slide, uh, which is a new country, uh, the world's newest country, uh, just set up, uh, it was officially sanctioned July 9th uh, of this year, where um, you have uh, a people who will for the first time be able to direct their own destiny after decades of uh, suffering you know, a repressive governance model uh, coming out of the north in, in Khartoum. The situation in Niger, where a, where a military coup was reversed in this past year, and they have resumed uh, a democratic course. And perhaps as important as any of these was uh, the successful elections held in Nigeria in April of this year. And Nigeria had uh, resumed a democratic course back in 1999, but had had a series of flawed elections since then. Uh, people were very discouraged and uh, 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 not optimistic about where Nigeria was going. But uh, through very um, well-run and transparent elections uh, in April, They've taken several uh, very important steps forward in their uh, move towards democratization. And given that Nigeria is the continent's largest 
country and, and largest democracy, um, it sets a very important precedent for, uh, for the region. So it, just in the past year, we've seen six countries starting down the democratic path in the region. So lots of change, lots of things still going on. And for as important as this is, and we can put out the next slide, um, it's part of a broader pattern that uh, we have seen over the past several decades. Really since the end of the Cold War, uh, uh, as Dr. Uh, McKittrick uh, uh, referenced, in 1988, or by 1990, in fact, uh, nearly every country in Africa was autocratic. Um, but since that time, we've seen a dramatic change. The number of autocracies on the continent has declined from 39 to 11, based on uh, independent indices of, of governance that we use. Um, and today, there is no country that is officially a, a one-party state, whereas that was the norm uh, at the end of the Cold War. At the same time, we've seen a bumping up in the number of democracies from two at the time of uh, the end of the Cold War to eight today. Um, and this past year, uh, we've seen an unprecedented number of uh, presidential national elections in Africa. There are 18 elections actually that have happened or are scheduled to happen in 2011. This has led many people to call 2011 the year of elections in, in Africa. I try to stay away from that because in fact 2012 is going to have as many elections. And what we're seeing is slowly a uh, routinization of elections in Africa. This is becoming the norm for how uh, political authority is, is determined. So an important you know, change that, uh, that is evolving. Um, next slide, please. And this, importantly, matches uh, a sea change in, global, uh, in, in governance patterns that we're seeing globally since the end of the Cold War. Um, I think we often take for granted that um, in the 19, uh, late 1980s, uh, only a third of the world's countries were democratic. Um, by the mid to late 1990s, that proportion had reversed. There were two thirds of countries that were democratic or on a democratic path. So for the first time in human history, you've had a majority of the world's population that is living uh, under some sort of democratic system. So this is all very uh, uh, you know, historic uh, in, in, in terms of a long-term perspective that we are still really, I think, adapting to and, and grappling with. Now, that said, you know, with all these positive developments, the democratization path is a bumpy path. Um, and uh, as you would expect, you know, becoming a democracy is not like flipping on a light switch. There are many uh, incremental uh, steps that uh, must be taken along the way. Next slide, please. And you know, referring back to our uh, our chart here of African governance, while it is notable the number of the decline in the number of autocracies that we have seen, um, you you note too that the number of democracies is not uh, uh, accumulated in the in the same proportion. You know, building democratic institutions is a longer term process than getting rid of uh, autocratic leaders. Um, and in fact, uh, the process of democratization itself is fraught with many challenges. Uh, it is uh, often uh, up and down rather than linear. Uh, in fact, 55% uh, of all African countries that have started down the democratic path have had at least one episode of backsliding towards uh, authoritarianism. Uh, importantly, uh, though, uh, two thirds of those countries that backtrack actually resume a positive trajectory within three years. So the fluctuating nature of governance changes in Africa I think is important to keep in mind that just because a country backslide doesn't mean the democratic experiment is over. And ten, and instead, that tends to be part of the pattern that we observe. There's uh, 
constantly, uh, there, 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 are, there are forces that are constantly battling in these countries for what the norms of governance are going to be, uh, who is going to be in control, and the sorts of rules of the game that are going to dictate matters. Um, these changes, these backslides, uh, often happen within the first six years of a new democratic transition. So it shows that um, when uh, you're trying to overturn uh, a often long-standing incumbent regime, there are many latent forces there that are going to try to undermine the process, and they are often well-equipped to do so. Uh, and uh, indeed, these uh, individuals and these networks uh, um, act as spoilers. They have a lot to lose in the democratic process. That's what we see today in uh, Zimbabwe with how hard the Mugabe regime there is going to, it has hung on and uh, will likely continue to hang on. You know, some of the other challenges that these democratization uh, processes face is that political monopolies um, often have translated into economic monopolies, too. And so these regimes and their supporters often have a lot of economic resources to support that hold in power. Just because there is a defeat, therefore, at the, at the ballot box doesn't mean that all those networks immediately go away. There's going to be pushback. Um, Dr. McKittrick mentioned a natural resource curse. Indeed, this is a, a very important um, uh, theme in a lot of the uh, governance challenges that we see. 60% of all Africans of Africa's autocracies are natural resource rich. Um, in fact, 21 African countries are considered natural resource rich overall. And this poses uh, many other challenges uh, for equality, corruption, um, distribution of power, stability. Another challenge to Africa's democratization is uh, conflict. 40% uh, of Africa's democratizers are emerging from conflict. And experience shows that uh, post-conflict democratization uh, processes are more difficult. It's harder to bring groups that have been fighting and they're polarized back together in some sort of cohesive uh, self-governing uh, model. Um, and finally, uh, and as Dr. McKittrick referenced, you know, many of Africa's states today are still focused on creating a, a shared sense of national identity. You know, they're still building their states at the same time they're trying to build their democracies. So all these things uh, create great challenges. And it's why uh, today even some of the relatively more established democracies like uh, Senegal, Benin, Kenya, Malawi, Zambia have uh, have been facing uh, some some concerns that they are backsliding, that leaders there are trying to entrench themselves in power, um, and so it's a ongoing challenge for for many, uh, if not all, of Africa's democratizers. All right, next slide, please. And so when we talk about African governance today. I think the key word is variance. There's a great variety of regimes out there, all the way from the continued uh, authoritarians on the, on the right side of this chart, to the, uh, to the democracies on, on the left side. What's most distinctive is that the majority, vast majority of uh, states out there are in between. You know, they have characteristics that are, are shared between uh, democratic and uh, authoritarian. Um, and you know, with the, the recent changes that I referenced at the beginning, you know, the, the most common grouping there are what we're calling democratizers. Uh, some 30 countries are taking substantive steps towards building democratic institutions, though haven't yet reached a threshold that would be deemed uh, universally as, uh, as being a democracy. So this is an unfolding process. Next slide, please. And uh, I think when we frame it in, in, the, in the broader pattern, we're seeing an ongoing battle of governance norms. 
in Africa? You know, which traje trajectory is it going to follow? Is it going to continue to move forward and, and democracy is going to become the dominant model? Or are these authoritarian forces going to hang on and pull things back and there'll be a, a more systematic uh, retrenching of that model? As you see from this uh, um, slide, which sort of summarizes the, the earlier one, countries on a democratic path versus those on an autocratic path. We've seen great change over the last uh, four or five years. Things have sort of uh, um, balanced out. We've seen about half of the countries leaning democratic, half the countries leaning autocratic, um, until this year, where you're seeing a, 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 a decided shift in that pattern. And we'll see if that shift is sustained or uh, if it is uh, aberration, or if, if it reverts back to, to something else. So th that is why this year and what's happening is, is so particularly important. Now, aside from the intrinsic value of democracy, um, there's the question of why does it matter? Does this really make a difference in the lives of people uh, in, in these countries? Next slide, Pete, please. And, uh, in fact, uh, it does make a difference. Um, you know, experience in Africa and elsewhere shows that, in fact, um, Afri uh, that democracies tend to perform better across a whole host of indicators. If we look at this to begin with, developmentally, um, African democracies have, uh, on average, generated economic growth that's uh, a third faster than autocracies on the continent. And if we take out the oil growth on the continent, it's actually a threefold difference in rates of growth uh, uh, on the continent. Uh, over the last 10 years, uh, we've seen uh, 15 African countries that are uh, growing at rates on average of 6% or more a year. So this has been an unprecedented and broad-based level of growth on the continent compared to what we've seen in, in previous decades. Um, and these economic figures have, have translated into social benefits by and large. Uh, citizens living in democracies in Africa tend to live a decade longer than people living in autocracies. Infant mortality rates in democracies are on average 35% lower in democracies than, than autocracy. Cereal yields in, Afri in, in African democracies are on average 25% higher than in autocracies, which of course, given that most of these remain rural-based societies, is particularly important for jobs and, and, and opportunities. So developmentally, there are a lot of ben benefits. We also see that pattern hold with regards to conflict. Um, African democracies have been 50% less likely to uh, fall into conflict um, since the end of the Cold War. And indeed, we've seen a 60% decline in both the frequency and the magnitude of conflict in Africa since 1994. Um, Dr. McKittrick referenced this as well, that you know, as the period of democratization has um, gained traction, we've seen this uh, commensurate decline in the and the regularity of, of conflict. It's a much more stable period to date, despite all of its problems, than uh, what it was even 15 years ago. And this is also matched in terms of humanitarian implications. Um, only 12% of the region's uh, refugees and internally displaced people uh, emerge or, or originate from countries that are democratic or, or, or democratizing. This is consistent with uh, a famous um, quote that uh, Nobel laureate uh, Martia Sen made many years ago that uh, there's never been a major famine in a democracy with a free press. So democracy's ability to mitigate um, catastrophe um, is one of the distinguishing features of these governance patterns. Um, so this is just to say governance does matter. It does have real implications. And it is why uh, how we think about it as uh, US government from each of the respective perspectives uh, is uh, particularly important 
uh, since it is in many ways um, counter valent to the dominant um, uh, thinking that has so influenced US policy for much of the um, post-colonial period that we've seen in Africa. All right, next slide. Um, now, just quickly, and this is a subject that we get into at, at much greater length, you may be asking, well, why, why is there a difference? And, and why, why would democracies perform better? And so I just wanted to touch on a couple of the key themes uh, that, that um, lead to this distinction. First is shared power. Democracies are built on mechanisms of shared power. This um, constrains the ability and the authority of a single individual to set policy. This in turn limits um, the pursuit of radical or ideologically based policies which um, are what are more likely to lead to crises or, or running out over the cliff before things can be reined in. Um, these mechanisms of share power also give incentives for thinking about the interest of the general population, the, the median voter matters, and so um, there's more incentive to invest in development and, and, and think about the well-being of the general population, human capital more generally. The second broad category or theme is democracies tend to be more open. Openness leads to more information getting on the table and into the decision-making process. Better information leads to better decisions. Um, a free press, uh, you know, a, a characteristic of openness, um, is also critical, we've seen, in terms of uh, avoiding these humanitarian catastrophes, that uh, a free press is the single best early warning system there is. And if there is a looming problem, and that gets on the front pages of the newspapers and the radio, that sets a lot of, uh, that sets a fire under political leaders to act in a democratic system. And this leads to the greater responsiveness and adaptability that democracies have in, in avoiding uh, crises before they become catastrophes. Openness also leads to more transparency. Transparency leads to less corruption. Indeed, democracies uh, show up as having 25, 35% less corruption than autocracies uh, on independent measures. And openness leads to more accountability. Um, and there's a, you know, a, a well-publicized case just over this past year in Kenya that some of you may have seen where uh, an undercover police, Kenyan police officer in Nairobi pulled aside some suspects uh, on the side of the road and um, you know, they were laying down on the pavement and he just summarily executed um, these uh, I think three or four um, suspects. Unfortunately for him, this was captured on a, you know, a mobile cell camera, uh, cell phone video, and uh, and it was posted on the on, on the web and in the media, and there that therefore it resulted in intense scrutiny of the Kenyan police practices. Um, this individual was suspended. An investigation was held, and the government had to respond to this. And without that openness, it's likely that sort of incident would have just you know, been swept under the, under the carpet. The third category that makes a difference uh, in, in these indicators that we see is democracies tend to be self-correcting. That is indeed a, a key mechanism how democracies are, are built. They're systems of trial and error, and they um, have incentives to create course, course corrections both within terms and between terms, the elections, so that societies can choose the type of leadership and the policy direction that they want for themselves at that particular time and, and that's suited for their particular context. So they're highly adaptive systems which allows democracies to weather the various crises and um, adapt to new circumstances better than, than other systems. And because this mechanism is systematized it tends to be more stable. You have fewer uh, conflicts that emerge from 
these tran these transitions, uh, and as a result, uh, it tends to reinforce the value of legitimacy for governing and creates disincentives for trying to find extra constitutional means of, of seizing power. So for all these reasons, democracies tend to do better. I think the upshot for, for us is that when we talk about democracy, we're talking, and, and democracy's value, we're talking about far more than elections. Uh, we're talking about you know, mechanisms of accountability. We're talking about mechanisms of shared power. In practical terms, we're talking about checks and balances on the chief executive. Uh, we're talking about an autonomous, merit-based civil service. We're talking about an independent uh, private sector. We're talking about the rule of law and uh, um, uh, an independent judiciary. We're talking about a free press. And these are the structures, the mechanisms that make a difference more than, than just elections. Uh, next slide, please. And in fact, uh, accountability matters. Uh, countries that have higher levels of accountability perform better developmentally and in terms of their security objectives. And unsurprisingly, you know, democracies tend to have higher levels of accountability. So they tend to uh, perform better as captured in this graphic. However, and uh, you know, importantly, you know, this is not a uniform pattern. Some democracies and democratizers have higher levels of accountability than others. And in that fact, they therefore perform better or worse, usually accordingly. And likewise, you know, there are some autocracies that have higher levels of accountability, and they tend, therefore, to um, achieve higher gains than, than other autocracies. So accountability is particularly relevant when we talk about democracy in Africa. And it is, I think, especially meaningful because in Africa, the legacy of governance models from colonialism and the post-colonialism era has been a neo-patrimonial model or a big man model of governance where you know, rather than power being shared, uh, power tends to be personality based. Accordingly, rather than loyalties being to the state, they tend to be to the individual. Um, rather than uh, leaders adhering to the law, it's sort of accepted that leaders are above the law. Um, rather than rules being applied uniformly, um, they tend to be applied selectively and sometimes punitively to target uh, political opponents. opponents. Rather than being openness, um, things tend to be managed by the patronage networks that uh, Professor McKittrick referenced, um, which tends to be less efficient and tends to benefit a select few in a society. And so for these reasons, you know, Africa's democratic uh, challenge is particularly steep relative to other regions. Um, and in fact, uh, when you look at the accountability scores of Africa's democratizers, next slide please, they tend more to resemble the <coughs> autocratic levels of accountability than they do the, the democratic uh, norms of accountability. Um, and so uh, you know, this is the real challenge, is why despite having adopted some of the trappings of democracy in many African countries, you're not seeing all of the results and benefits that you will in a more substantive uh, uh, and institutionally based democratic system. And this is why even some of Africa's more established democracies and, and more mature democratizers continue to have the challenges. They are having to overcome these neo-patrimonial governance uh, legacies, these big man models that continue to hold a lot of sway. Okay, and you know, while recognizing that, and I think it's important, I think it's also important to recognize that accountability structures in Africa are changing. Um, we are seeing you know, over the past decade um, an increased 
uh, level of capacity and influence of Africa's parliaments, who are um, increasingly serving as a check on the executive branch, asking more questions, assuming their responsibilities and budget allocations to, to a greater extent. African civil society has become much stronger today than it was um, 15 years ago, much more active, much more involved uh, in, the pub in the public debate than, than, it, than, it, than it was previously. Um, within Africa, regional institutions are playing an increasingly prominent role in intervening in countries that are um, acting extra-legally. And so there's a, a higher standard that has been set by the African Union and the regional economic communities to make sure that there are uh, uh, constitutionally based mechanisms of transition. I referenced Cote d'Ivoire at the beginning. And indeed, if it wasn't for the African Union, and especially ECOWAS, um, that transition may not have happened. And then I, I will hold out the importance of uh, the explosion of information communication and communications technology on the continent. That uh, um, you know, over the last decade, we've seen there being almost an absence of cell phones to today, one in, one in three of Africans have access to a cell phone. Um, it's transforming the information environment on the continent, and this is having real impacts on accountability and governance. I referenced the Nairobi police example. Um, even in the recent Nigerian uh, election, one of the um, quotes that came out of the uh, post-election review was that somebody from, from, the, from the ruling party said, well, even if we wanted to steal that election, we, we determined that we couldn't because there are too many people with cell phones around and they would have you know, probably taken a picture or went over, you know, looking over our shoulder and, uh, and, and, and documented it. And so you know, the leadership in many African countries recognize the changing game. It's not to say that they're not going to try to get around it, but the, the bar is, is uh, rising increasingly. So in sum, you know, we are experiencing, we're observing a period of historic change in governance systems in Africa. Um, and this is a strategic phenomenon that will have direct implications for security and development on the continent. However, the extent to which these benefits accrue will be a factor of the extent to which accountability structures are created. Um, and uh, because these are institutionally based processes, it's, it's a long-term process. You know, while there will be individual breakthroughs, these are important, they should be supported, um, it is the longer term sustaining and creation of these institutions of accountability that will ultimately carry the day for how these governance changes benefit Africa. Thank you very much.